system. I believe we have over 250 people registered for today's session, and I am delighted to welcome everyone to the session on Innovative Medicaid Payment Strategies for Financing Upstream Prevention. As we, we have an illustrious group of speakers today, and I'll introduce each of them after some brief introductory comments about the project. I want to provide some logistics for submitting questions for the panelists. This slide shows how you can submit a question. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation by opening the Q&A panel on the right hand of your screen. You should select host as the recipient and then type in your question into the box and hit send. After the presentation, I'll post the questions you submit to our panelists. And second, I did want to let you know that we are we will share the speaker PowerPoints after the session and that uh, we are recording the session and we'll send you a link. Our highlights, the findings of the Medicaid Payment Strategies for Financing Upstream Prevention Project that was led by our team at Nemours. It was funded and part of a larger Academy Health project called Payment Reform for Population Health Initiative. And I want to introduce Inri Martinez Vidal from Academy Health to say a few words about the P for P project. And, and, and I'd also like to say that it's really been truly a pleasure and a privilege to work with Enrique and his team, including Susan Kay. And um, it's been a true partnership, and we've learned a lot from this and really benefited um, from this, and the contributions will help the field overall. So with that, let me turn it over to Enrique. Or provide lives, and, and that actually created a lot of tension when you start thinking about um, payment models, which are very focused on reimbursing for individual services, and then thinking about sort of total community health. So there's a, there's a sort of some tension right there. Um, so to go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a, uh, a, a framework that we developed uh, over many iterations, and really we started sort of the top level of it. I'm not going to go into the details here, but the top level was really trying to look at the money that's in the healthcare system and through the payment models. And then when we started diving in further, there's a lot of money in community benefits that actually supports social determinants of health. There's other money that are sort of in the operations side of the healthcare system that also were being used. Um, and then sort of at the bottom of the, the framework were the social determinants of health, the community resources that, that we were trying to figure out how to pay for. And then sort of all this piece in between was, was a lot of the work that we, we uncovered and, and spoke with a lot of key informants and knowledgeable people out in communities. Um, and I, I call this sort of the middleware. This is, this is sort of the enablers and the vehicles for these two systems to connect to each other. Um, and you'll hear a lot of, uh, of, of, of talk about a lot of these, this middleware part in, in the work that was done um, in, in Oregon, Washington, and, and Maryland under this project. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, this, um, after a lot of engagement with various communities, we really found that there were certain foundational elements that all have to interact with each other and support each other in order to actually get to this a whole idea of payment and financing models. Um, so, so we came up with this infographic. I mean, everybody needs an infographic, right? So, uh, so we, here we have sort of the shared data that sort of uh, underpins a lot of this work. You have to have a trusted environment where this collaboration can take place. You have to align these clinical and community resources, and then you have the payment and financing models to really support this kind of work. Um, so then the next slide. Uh, it's just a slide uh, that shows, I don't want to say just a slide, it's a slide that shows all of our collaborative partners and projects. Um, you can see all, all of the, the folks who we worked with under this project. Um, I won't go through all of them. All these um, sub-bullets are actually um, reports and studies that we've that, that we've put together um, with with our partners, and, and you can see the last one is the Nemours one that we're talking about today. Um, then at the bottom of the slide is the um, is the link to Academy Health's 
a web page on this project, and all of these reports can be found there. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to Debbie. One buddy while I get this back. That's me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nick. In 2017, we really had the privilege and honor of working with three states, Maryland and Washington State, to explore current Medicaid authorities to promote and provide prevent community settings to cover upstream benefits and to deliver and to deliver services using non-traditional community-based providers. This project built upon an earlier 2016 and Morris project funded by the Robert Johnson Foundation that developed a roadmap and other resources for states uh, to show the tremendous authority under current Medicaid law to implement prevention interventions. We wanted to dig deeply and see if we could help these three states to leverage existing Medicaid authorities to implement upstream prevention interventions. So and the team worked with the Medicaid agency to connect one Medicaid MCO with, with a Head Start Center in the interest of linking families to needed services in the community. We were working with them to place dietitians on site at child care centers to provide group services. In order, the team worked with a CCO to see how it could use low capitation payment to cover community care coordination and non-medical services deliver the Bridges to Health Pathways Hub, and how to structure such payments so they align with the principles of value-based uh, value payments. In Washington, the team worked with the Healthcare Authority and two accountable communities for health to help define the business case for investing in upstream prevention and to encourage all state ac uh, accountable communities for health to consider developing community initiatives to prevent chronic diseases and integrate community health workers to help achieve their goals. So speakers today um, will we'll discuss these efforts in more detail, and they'll lift up information on how we implement these initiatives and lessons they learned that would help other states adopt these initiatives. And these are the six issue briefs, actually seven, that we ended up developing that lift up the how. This project was very much focused on how states can adopt and, and benefit the lessons learned in Maryland, Oregon, and Washington. So our speakers today will be referring to their respective briefs that relate to the work on their projects. I'm going to focus on a bit on the lessons learned so that you just get a sense of the, some of the takeaways that we um, that we um, had that I thought would be helpful for you to hear before you get into more of the detailed presentation. So the point is having the right people at the right table. You know, states need a high-level champion involved in work from the beginning. And, you know, obviously the engagement of the state's Medicaid director really helps to facilitate decision-making, collaboration with counterparts at other agencies and can build momentum for new initiatives policy change. The second, allowing flexibility on how to accomplish goals, we really heard from our state partners who said that, you know, it's important for the government to set transformational goals. The specifics on how these goals are achieved should be left to all the stakeholders. Another cross-cutting lesson learned was looking um, for ripe opportunities for cross-sector alignment among specific, specific populations, such as children. So you can look for opportunities to reduce duplication of things like care management activities and services by increasing collaboration across programs serving the same population. Another lesson learned was employing strategies that link traditional clinical care with community-based prevention initiatives as a portfolio of investment. The portfolio was really important because when you look at um, strategies that address chronic diseases for a range of populations, you have both short-term and long-term impacts. And in fact, many of the um, savings or the impact for prevention happens in the long run. So by doing a portfolio of investments, the perceived risks 
of focusing on prevention um, in the short run are mitigated. And at the same time, this allows for consideration of strategies with longer-term impact. And then focusing interventions on the family unit as a source rather than just one individual. You know, clearly by considering the family rather than the individual, a broad understanding of which patients may be positively impacted by an intervention and creates greater flexibility for how services can be paid. The other um, lessons learned was to, um, as a state, to engage in CMS as a partner rather than just view them as a, a payer or, or a compliance enforcer. Um, so working at the front end with CMS, um, either the federal office or the regional office early uh, was a positive lesson learned. Uh, we had another lesson about thinking broadly about ways to use payment reform rather than specifically addressing a specific issue. So patient and community sources, uh, resources, they're going to vary greatly. So a broader approach that has built-in flexibility and adaptation will enable local stakeholders to develop tailored solutions. Uh, the flexibility under current federal medication, I mean, Medicaid regulations. There's a tremendous amount of flexibility under current Medicaid regulations. And our work in Maryland, Oregon, and Washington illustrates the way Medicaid can be used to provide interventions in different community settings, to use additional providers, and to provide upstream non-medical but health-related services, and to pay for community care coordination systems. That we're continuing this work with these states in 2018. We're now working with these states and DC on how to improve coordination between Medicaid and early care and education sector, that is child care, as well as how to go upstream to address uh, prevention. So now uh, introduce our uh, our speakers uh, all at once. Here is uh, Marianne Lindemann. She's a uh, Director for the State of Washington. She brings a broad health care administrative background to the top position in Washington State. Uh, Marianne has been an active health care professional as well as a leader spanning most aspects of health care, including acute care, long term care, behavioral health, elder care, prevention, and services for people with disabilities. She has a very long and distinguished career in public service at the state level. For example, she served as Assistant Secretary for Aging and Disability. She served also um, as the Assistant Administrator of the Public Employees Benefit. And she also worked in the private sector as Director of Operations for United Physicians of Washington. Next will be Coco Yackley. She's the Operations Manager with the Columbia Gorge Health Council. Uh, Coco is the Operations Manager and the decision-making body of that runs for the, the, the decision-making body of the Pacific North Columbia Gorge PCO. Causes the community partners to implement health systems transformation, including regional approach to community health assessments, the community health improvement plans, and a community regional health information exchange platform. The collab effort in, uh, in the Gorge turns the CCO requirements from Oregon makers into an extraordinary opportunity to improve health and wellness of all residents. And prior to this working in healthcare, Coco has a unique background working uh, for Intel for 20, 20 years in a variety of leadership roles. Our final speaker is Alicia Steinberg. She is principal with Burton Policy Consulting, a health policy consulting firm which helps public private sector to navigate the opportunities and challenges of the rapidly changing healthcare environment. Ali has extensive experience in the design, administration, and evaluation of Medicaid programs, and she was deputy director in the Maryland Medicaid Office of Planning. Alicia has worked on a broad range of initiatives in Maryland, including uh, coordinating new payment reforms designed to align hospitals and physicians, um, Helen, a Medicaid finance primary care program for adults, and redesigning delivery systems for children with special needs. Alicia has also been a featured speaker by uh, the Obama Administration White House and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, 
and the House Speaker regarding the effects of the ADA on families and children. With that, we turn it over to Marianne Lindeblad. Marianne? We're losing the slide, so it'll be just a minute. <clears throat> Our Right. Well, I want, to, I want to thank you for the opportunity today to be here and just share some of the experience that Washington has in um, that we're taking and transferring our, our transforming our Medicaid delivery system um, and uh, the fact and, uh, and some. Um, comments too on the work that we did with um, Nemours and the support that we got from Nemours to help us really further our efforts. So that's going to be my focus today. But um, first of all, I just want to create some context and some background for you on the delivery system in the state of Washington. Um, I work for the Washington State Healthcare Authority that runs not only the Medi state Medicaid program, but also um, our public employees uh, benefits and uh, starting in 2020, school employee benefits. And that coordination across um, the, the three programs certainly makes our agency uh, the dominant purchaser um, in the state. Uh, we spend over $10 billion annually. Um, we purchase health care today for over 2.2 million folks. And while there isn't always um, the same providers um, or the same health plans that we're dealing with between state employees and with um, our Medicaid, there's a significant overlap in uh, providers. Um, we have uh, set some very ambitious value-based purchasing goals for ourselves, um, but not just for Medicaid, but also for the state in general. And we're working to have 90% um, of the state-financed health care in Medicaid um, in some sort of value-based purchasing arrangement by 2021. So again, very aggressive. Um, some support. Certainly, uh, we were one of the states that got a, a SIM Round 2 grant um, through CMMI, which actually runs out in January of next year. Uh, but also, we're fortunate to have a Medicaid transformation demonstration project that runs through 2021 and actually is bringing up to $1.5 billion into our state to help support the Medicaid program. Um, you'll hear us in Washington talk a lot about Healthier Washington. And that is really our overall initiative, um, and it really does embody the commitment as a state um, from our governor on down to improve the health of our people and our communities. Um, really, our three strategies, certainly how we pay for value, um, are building our healthier communities <clears throat> through regional collaboration, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, and ensuring that we're really, our focus is really on um, whole person care. Uh, you know, the long-term vision of Healthier Washington is really about the system that uh, works the best for those who are served by it. And not unlike um, other states, often our approach is somewhat fragmented, um, not great care transitions. Our clients aren't as engaged as we'd certainly like them to be. Um, we, we certainly have a workforce issue. Um, we have... Um, we have consistent performance measures in the in to, uh, uh, measure <clears throat> system performance, and much of our payment is, is um, volume based instead of value. So over the next well over the next several years between now and 2021, um, really transforming our delivery system into one that is integrated and really delivers whole person care. Um, we have coordinated care transitions. Our clients are activated, and motivated. Uh, they have optimal access to appropriate services. Uh, we use a standard set of standardized set of performance measures in value-based payment. Talk a bit about our accountable communities of health because they are a major um, focus on how we move forward in achieving the goals that we have. A uh, map here just depicts the nine accountable communities of health. They're, they're single counties of groups of counties. And through those ACHs, um, these are organizations that um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, uh, are addressing health issues on a local level and collaborating with the health plans, with providers, with other members of the community, with um, uh, jails, with schools, just a very broad-based set of individuals that are coming together to really look at what are the resources the state is spending, what the county cities are spending, what other players are bringing to the table, and how do we align those resources, how do we align those activities so we can really improve the health of our, of our members. And also as a way through our transformation uh, monies to use the um, ACHs as a vehicle to support local and statewide transitions and focused on things like practice transformation, health equity, and value-based purchases. We were very fortunate to be one of the states that Moore has decided to work with and has been very helpful with their assistance. Um, we were able to uh, use that assistance to help us um, <clears throat> overcome some barriers with our ACHs. Uh, first, many of the stakeholders were struggling to make that business case um, for the, to the payers for investing in upstream pr provision. So this was an area where more could be helpful to, and also um, with our health plans and providers, and clearly with our ACHs, um, really helping them um, because when they are starting from scratch, when they're trying to figure out uh, what um, preventions to deploy, and so help in that area. So in part, um, we were able to, like I said, work with Nemours and the work that they did with us to help us um, look at certain chronic disease prevention projects and, and create that issue brief. Um, and Debbie was talking um, earlier about the issue briefs that um, Nemours helped develop. So working with the ACHs, um, Nemours was able to um, create resources that were specific to that ACH. And again, as I mentioned, helping, helping outline the financial benefits to the ACHs so they could help choose the, um, the programs that they wanted to focus um, on in their region. Uh, I think where it was very helpful is it was able to help focus on things like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, this <clears throat> trying to continue to clear my throat, um, looking at things like mechanisms to reduce Medicaid spending on certain services, so those dollars could be reinvested in a more um, focused way and in a way that really promoted prevention and early intervention, um, improving the health of our members, preventing chronic disease, uh, reducing costs in other sectors, and promoting the goals of VBP. Some of the highlights from the brief that they, pre that they um, support that was by Nemours is going out and doing some of that um, research that looks at <clears throat> uh, can be saved in Medicaid programs um, when they actually do um, more focused um, disease management, more focused um, Approaches in primary prevention and being able to look at some um, <clears throat> existing programs so out there researching what's in the literature and using some existing programs that we, they could demonstrate that ROI and could come up with some estimates of how much um, a state like Washington could save in terms of a return on investment with primary prevention programs. Um, also, helping the ACH look at um, structures that already exist in the state that support the vision of Healthier Washington. So, for example, really getting the plans, our managed care plans focused on certain performance measures, how they do their quality reporting, um, supporting the incentive payments, how the approach works um, to help drive uh, care improvements, and providing some of that resource um, information and contracting um, for the plans as they are moving forward to help advance um, population health goals that they have. Um, so this issue brief of making the case for prevention was it, very helpful and the brief was shared with all of our nine ACHs and was helpful to them as they were selecting regional transformation projects. And all of the, the um, ACHs had um, eight different projects to choose from. Um, two were mandatory. Um, that was bi-directional behavioral health and one on opioid um, 
services to treat folks with opioid addiction, and they were um, they could select six optional, up to six optional, but they had to select at least two of the optional. And online ACHs did submit proposals that included a chronic disease prevention project. And I do believe that this work that was supported by Nemours really helped them um, in their selections because most of the ACHs did not in, did not um, select all eight projects. Most of them selected four. So um, this work that Nemours did with us really helped them, I think, define and uh, gave the background and information that helped them select their proposals. Then there's a part two to this um, where Nemours helped uh, two of the ACHs and be making a more of a deep dive and how they could develop some viable payment models that would support community health workers into their uh, uh, Medicaid transformation projects. So the team supported, specifically supported these two ACHs, um, helped them find other resources with other states that were using CH uh, community health workers, um, looking at different payment mechanisms, um, looking at what is the flexibility under Medicaid regulations um, so they could cover other coordination and the value added services, including those provided by um, community health workers. And then some various strategies for the ACHs to partner with the uh, care plans um, that uh, work closely with our members and help the plans think about how they could best um, support um, community health workers. <clears throat> so again, this issue brief on integrating um, community health workers into the transformation projects. So the brief. Uh, does provide some um, common definition and roles for uh, community health workers, um, helps with the evidence behind that, and various um, financing options that were available. So again, some of the highlights that you'll see from the issue brief is providing that evidence base and the and kind of um, return investment analysis. Um, uh, community health workers, and also helping the plans think through some of the flexibility they have in various financing models. So looking at new re the new regulations that came out in 2016 for Medicaid managed care and how to use that flexibility to cut care coordination and some additional value added services. So just some of the lessons learned and from this work that we did with Nemours was they're making that business case. They really helped us think that through and helped in terms of looking at national evidence. You don't have to create it here within your own state, but look at um, other work that has been done and how to identify um, both the financial and health impacts when you um, invest in prevention. Um, also, um, looking at how to use community health workers uh, to improve health outcomes for individuals with chronic disease and allowing that flexibility and how the ACHs could all tailor their various projects to meet their um, unique needs. So uh, the, it was really um, for us a very helpful um, endeavor and we'll be continuing to work with Nemours on um, furthering this work. Um, they've. Um, with, with the work that we've done at the community level and the ACHs, this type of um, technical assistance has been invaluable for us. Um, the last slide just provides some information if you want to learn more about our Healthier Washington initiatives on the website to do that. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you so much for your leadership, not in Washington State, but across the country. We'll move to Coco. Sure. Is everyone able to see my screen just fine? Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, welcome to Oregon. And Marianne, thank you so much for, you know, you were talking about what's going with medic, you know, reform within Washington. We're going to zero in now into a rural community on the Oregon side that both states are, are on their respective journeys for for Medicaid reform, and we're doing it in slightly different ways, but in some ways there's a lot of parallels, right? It's better better health care, better health, you know, lower cost for everybody involved. And this picture here is, most people know, 
our region by Mount Hood, but in the foreground, as we are in a rural community, agricultural community out here in the Columbia Gorge region, and with that comes both the challenges and the opportunities of working in a rural community. In the of Oregon, we um, start on a uh, Medicaid reform transformation program um, five years ago. It's hard to almost say that out loud. Um, <laughs> And with that established uh, coordinated care organizations that service the Medicaid clients within certain geographical areas. And the Pacific Source Community Solutions Coordinated Care Organization of the Columbia Gorge is in bright pink up in the top part of the state along the uh, Columbia River. Um, that's the area that uh, I come from. And within that state, uh, you know, within that, the whole state had a similar situation as how do you control costs? How do you make sure that you do effective coordination and you can step away from being able to do what feels like really silly things because you're, you don't have all of the payers around or all the provider network together. And so the state laid out a policy and a framework for coordinated care organizations that included providing a global budget for which take care of a set of lives within a geographical region, and that's our coordinated care organizations. In the budget, they incorporated physical health, mental health, dental health, as well as non-emergency medical transportation, the um, service for long-term care, as well as um, in-home services, those remain outside of our budgets. But within that context, that's what we were responsible for establishing. In addition, the CCO structures vary across the state. Um, in the case of the Gold region, we have a Pacific Force is the health plan and is the contractor of record with the Oregon Health Authority. And there is a local government organizations work together to be the CCO, to deliver against all of the CCO requirements. Pacific Source handles all of the contracting elements associated with a provider network, and the Health Council has everything associated with uh, what does uh, the community input, what does the community health assessment and community health improvement plan uh, functions that are required by the state. One of the verbals that we had to do in the early days was to do a community health assessment. And when we started on that activity, we learned that many organizations also had to do a community health assessment. So one of our first opportunities to sort of change how work is done in the community was say, can we come together and have one comprehensive community health assessment that serves the needs of our Federal Qualified Health Center, um, all of the hospitals in our region, public health, as well as meeting the requirements of the CCO and other entities, and our community mental health agency. We were successful in doing that. We've done that now two cycles. And as part of doing that activity, we have expanded our scope to go beyond just the two counties of our CCO, but to include seven counties. We trip over into the Washington side as well, and we're able to bring all of these partners together. And I emphasize this because as Enrique was speaking about earlier, have a trusted environment, this work product normal for us that we can do things together that historically had been done separately. And that's a pretty powerful result for us and has um, provided um, further on benefits that we had ever imagined. And from that in our community health improvement plan and work that we had been doing with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we found this framework for how you describe improving health in your community. And we do that um, by looking at our data in these different uh, elements to figure out where do we want to improve health. And by having a framework like this, it provides us as a community a shared language for our goals and our endeavors that we want to go through in terms of uh, improving health in the community. To reinforce the ruralness, this is our second largest city in our region. <laughs> um, it gives you a sense of scale and size here. And the reason why I emphasize um, kind of our smallness is this, be 
since we are small, we end up with organizations that handle multiple functions that in a larger metropolitan area might be split off uh, in organizations. For example, our economic development district for the region is also running one aspect of the bus system. We have a, um, in, our, in our region, all of the primary care providers take all payers. Um, they take Medicaid, Medicare, private, doesn't matter. So they take all forms of, pay, of um, insurance. And nonprofits many times house multiple programs. For example, we have um, Big Brothers Big Sisters and a small business incubator, as well as our community health worker uh, training center, all operated out of one of our local nonprofits. That means, though, that we also have a less segregated healthcare system as a result of that, and we're all kind of know each other, and it enables um, us to be able to start to think, how might we, how could we, how might we do something? In our work for which we were engaged with, with, with Nemours was trying to help us look at payment reform for care coordination problem we were faced with. And the example and uh, dynamic we found in our community is that an individual affiliated with an organization, and in this particular case, we're talking about um, Head Start, is doing a home visit on a child suspected of having developmental delays. And while in the home, they learned that they're um, not they're there. There's also a grandmother, and it turns out the child's aunt and their three children are also in the home um, dealing with domestic violence. Of course, uh, anybody in a care coordination, care uh, service, home visiting, this is a gut-wrenching example of I'm here for the purposes of Head Start, and I see all of this other stuff. Because clearly this is the household dynamic uh, this child's living with, but the constraints of how Head Start's funded and what they can and can't do in terms of their funding stream was really a limiter. And when we went to Nemours, it was, can you help solve this problem? Um, we had the community selected uh, to use the Pathways Program as a means for standardizing um, care coordination. And important aspect about that care coordination is that it would happen in agencies that would allow people like Sam to go past the Head Start and to be able to tap into a funding stream beyond the Head Start funding stream to be able to really serve the needs of the household. We're able to, with our Pathways Hub, um, the way that sets up is clients agree to participate. The community care coordinators who are certified community health workers, but they also might be um, home visiting nurses out of public health. There could be a variety of job roles. They are within the organizations that they're currently working with. They already are working with clients and know of situations where the household has needs beyond what they in their traditional job scope could do. And with the, uh, our job was to find money to bring forward so that we can pay when it goes past um, their currently covered services. Initially started out with a grant funding to get us going, but the question that was on the table with Pacific Source and um, the Columbia Gorge Health Council is how do we tap into Medicaid funding traditional um, health care funding in a non-grant scenario such that this could be a billable service. And with that, we would be able to serve the needs of the family to deal with not only making sure that their basic medical needs are net met, but we are really working through to um, make sure we have a standard methodology in how care coordination is happening out in the homes. We'll swing this together through a standardized hub we can to look at where are the consistent barriers that exist and identify those in a comprehensive, complete way to allow us to look at where do we need to make larger investments in the community um, because everybody's struggling with 
whatever activity or whatever service it might be. So case now with our Pathways Hub, which has been running for a year, um, Sam is able to ask the aunt about if she's interested in participating in the Pathways path programs. And Sam can check in our Claire data system to make sure that no one else has, no other care coordinator has enrolled her. And that's an important thing for us to make sure we don't duplicate um, what somebody else is already doing. They lead an assessment. They agree to work on some pathways. And in, um, in the work that Sam would normally do, he's not only helping a child in that home that was part of the Head Start program, but is able to address the needs of the rest of the household um, and make sure that that individual is able to, for example, get enrolled in health insurance. It might be um, housing. Um, challenges, how to access transportation, and the various needs um, that that individual might have. The it for really felt different. Um, yes, we were generating power just from a different source, a little bit renewable source, but we already had people going to these homes. So how can we really leverage um, uh, that capability? And so what Nemours did for us, and the, I realized this looks like wow. Uh, there's a lot of dots and letters and numbers and parentheses around this. This definitely looks like uh, legislative rulings. But Nemours was able to really tease out and look at the contracts that we have with the state, tease that out about what visions and how does that represent itself into our financial, you know, from financials perspective. What can we do? What can we not do? What does a value-added service component look like? This level of research for us and technical assistance made it possible for Pacific Source to be able to contract with, so now, instead of uh, grants funding the hub, we have uh, Pacific Source from a Medicaid funding perspective uh, flowing in dollars for Medicaid clients in serving their care coordination needs. This is a significant breakthrough for us because with our data system, we have shared data. With our, uh, the fact that the care coordinators are not employed by the Health Council but distributed cross organizational that really creates substantial buy-in and alignment in our community. And now we have sort of that last leg of the stool, which is the payment and financing avenue with our Medicaid dream, and we have a framework for which to approach other health plans when working with clients, and then just absolutely foundational for us. We have, you know, what kind of treatments that we might do with a client. Um, there are a couple, though, that we learned in this process where we cannot pay for. Health insurance enrollment is an activity that is not uh, Medicaid health insurance enrollment. We cannot use Medicaid dollars for. That is a restriction there. And it turns out smoking cessation is a covered service. So the next level of detail was really um, teasing out um, what is considered an already covered service, what is not allowed, and we were able to looking at our coordinated care um, membership that we can get the bulk, the lion's share of these treatments covered, and that for individual outcomes, um, you know, really drive that forward. Uh, we have some other articles as well about uh, the hub itself and how we stood that up and then work around how we've done some of our collaborative work here in the region. But I really want to emphasize that the payment piece was something that was exquisitely um, a challenge for us, and had we not had Nemours, it's not clear that we would be able to be at the state stage that we're at. And we had interest from other CCOs asking us regarding can there, how much of the contract, how much, what did you do, what was the framework, and so we're having that chance to share it across Oregon, and so appreciative of work from Nemours. Yeah. Paige, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Coco. That was wonderful. And thank you for your leadership at the local level. Um, I just want to remind people as we're getting set up for Alicia to go next 
that um, there's the, I mentioned just early, or before maybe some of you got on, that you can submit questions um, to us. And after Alicia's uh, finished uh, with her presentation, then we will be able to um, ask and pose questions. We'll have a little bit of time between the time Alicia's finished, so maybe around 15 minutes to ask questions. So please send your questions in order to further discussion. With that, I'm trying to uh, be able to get on here. It sounds like we have a technical challenge because I don't see the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, the screen link and I'll get my slides up. Or if oh, you have control, so if you go to the top tool where it's a share. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to talk about a Maryland pilot to um, deliver Medicaid nutritional counseling services and a Head Start study. Um, this is Medicaid agencies and their partners can explore delivering services in non-clinical non settings and existing federal Medicaid authority. Um, the focus in Maryland has been on obesity prevention and nutritional counseling for this pilot, but experience is really relevant to other strategies that link traditional clinical preventive care to community-based settings. Since 2017, Nemours has provided technical assistance to Maryland Medicaid to explore childhood obesity prevention strategies. And Burton Policy went in to help with the TA, and as a former Maryland Medicaid staffer, I was happy to support a great Maryland team. Um, and the work culminated in a pilot to deliver Medicaid nutritional count services in Head Start. It is a partnership with the Maryland Department of Health, which houses the Medicaid agency, um, one of the Medicaid MCOs, the Maryland Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is the state um, dietitian provider association, and a Head Start program in Baltimore City. The technical assistance has included policy research and the mapping and analysis of the operational steps to get to implementation. And I really can't overstate how important the operational pieces are. Um, we've had a small group take the time to really get into the weeds on issues such as provider credentialing, um, what codes to use. Um, the last thing we wanted to do was set up an initiative only to have claims denied and create frustration. So it's been really great to have the small team working through those issues. Um, just the Maryland context, um, Maryland has a robust managed care system known as Health Choice, which has been in place since 1997. Most Medicaid um, enrollees, including most children, are in managed care plans. Um, there are nine different um, Health Choice MCOs um, at this time. And Medicaid in Maryland, like in other states, increasingly has had a population health focus with um, a range of community health pilot initiatives. Um, for example, there's a relatively recent evidence-based service that targets pregnant women and young children. Um, so there's a lot going on in Maryland that has synergies with, um, with the pilot that we're talking about today. Maryland is focused on obesity prevention, given that approximately one in three low-income um, preschool-aged children are overweight or obese. Um, Maryland's, um, the prevalence of, of obesity in Maryland is similar to um, elsewhere in the nation. Um, and as we all know, childhood obesity is linked to a number of chronic diseases. So Maryland saw nutritional counseling as one strategy to address childhood overweight and obesity. Um, a number of local and state activities contributed to where Maryland is today with its pilot. Um, these were community-based, um, clinic-based, and, and policy-level activities uh, that involved some of the same partners over time. So in 2012, there was um, a community campaign uh, targeting sugary drink consumption that included Head Start partners. Um, at the same time, a local foundation, um, the Horizon Foundation, and the Maryland chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics were um, piloting um, clinic-based initiatives to target pediatric obesity. Um, Maryland participated in a CHCS, Center for Health Care Strategies, initiative related to childhood obesity. 
Um, in 2016, the Horizon Foundation funded um, a Head Start program that um, promoted healthy eating habits and management of chronic disease. Um, as Debbie mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of our webinar, um, Nemours had developed a roadmap of how states and MCOs can implement Medicaid prevention, and so that um, fed some of the conversations among these partners. In late 2016, Maryland received the Medicaid State Plan Amendment to cover group nutritional counseling for children as part of the PSUT benefit. Um, so a lesson from this evolution um, is highlighted there in the blue box, um, and we talk about this in one of our issue briefs, that not surprisingly, it's easier to get movement on an initiative where it already exists. Now, specifics of Maryland's pilot. Um, we're really thinking about this as a test of feasibility. Um, as I said, we're starting um, starting small to get this up and running, um, identify and overcome obstacles, and see if this approach can be scaled up. So um, nutritional counseling services would be provided by a licensed dietitian and or by a Medicaid-managed care organization. Um, the target population are children who attend the participating Head Start. Um, are enrolled in the participating MBO and have a BMI at or above the 85th percentile, so the kind of standard definition of um, childhood overweight and obesity. Um, so this is the pilot scope and process. The first step would be identifying the target population. Um, the head, head Start staff would screen children BMI um, based on height and weight, um, determine whether or not those children are in the participating MCO. Um, and then the next step would be for the Head Start to let families know about the opportunity to receive um, good nutritional counseling services at Head Start at no cost. Um, interested families would be referred by the Head Start um, and to the dietitian would work with, um, with the Head Start and the families to um, schedule, you know, the service schedule and time. Um, there will be an initial dietitian assessment up front um, at the beginning of services. Um, the parent would be present at that with the child, and that will identify needs and strengths, determine goals, and a plan of care, um, and that would help inform the content of subsequent individual or group counseling sessions. Um, the dietitian would conduct between six and 12 group counseling sessions. Um, some of those will be offered before or after school with topics geared towards the parents. Um, and alternatively, some of the group sessions could be held with the children um, and the teacher during the school day. In that scenario, for us, not just those meeting the eligibility criteria, um, topics would be appropriate for children, and then information would be sent home with the kids so the parents could see um, what was covered during the school day. Okay. Um, and at the end of this cycle, there would be uh, another individual meeting with the dietitian, the child, and the parent um, to assess progress towards goals. Um, the knowledge shows uh, the timeline, some of which I've already touched on, and the big takeaway is that building on a cross-sector collaboration can take time. Um, so as I mentioned, Maryland got its um, new spot for group counseling in late 2016. And then through 27 and 2018, we worked on some of the, um, the recent planning um, and the partnership with the Head Start program really solidified this spring. And the summer, we're intensifying some of the planning activities. Um, for example, studying the curriculum, um, clarifying what screen tool or documentation the Head Start staff will use, um, tracking the outreach letter that will go to parents. Um, services will be launched in the fall. Um, considerations that have come up uh, among the group and the midst of our discussion um, is how to maximize interest among families. Unfortunately, um, Head Start has a lot of expertise in family engagement. Um, and, for example, one idea that's come up in discussions is um, how the Head Start holiday superstore could be used to encourage families to participate in this initiative. Um, the way that works is families earn points for attending different kind of parenting workshops, and then they use those points to shop for, um, for gifts around the holidays that uh, at 
the superstore that the Head Start creates from the donations it receives. Um, we want to expand the nutritional support services that are already in place at Head Start to ensure that the pilot's complementary and not duplicative. Um, we want to make sure that there's the plan of care with the child's medical home to prevent any service fragmentation. Um, that's sort of similar to how um, information is shared back from school-based health services back to the child's medical home. So we have um, a model for how to do that. Uh, and we want to um, deliver services broadly to avoid singling out any children. So as I had mentioned before, all children will receive group counseling um, that's delivered during the school day, but the dietitian would bill only for those children who meet the medical necessity criteria and who are in the participating MCO. The early lessons learned um, is that um, it helps to invest in the relationship building and, I, and identify a translator when establishing new collaborations across systems. Um, we're very fortunate to have an early care and education expert as part of the Morris team, um, a former Head Start executive director. So she's really provided a lot of insight on um, on sort of how processes work at Head Start, for example, the intake and enrollment process and, and um, case management. Um, that it can really help to break down administrative barriers. Um, so, for example, there were some misconceptions that we found among the dietitian community about um, Medicaid provider enrollment and the MCO credentialing process. Um, those got somewhat technical around um, when you could use your group MPI versus individual MPI. Um, we were able to um, unearth those misconceptions and, and try to make sure that we were um, getting the right information out. Um, even though it was pretty clearly uh, explained on the Medicaid provider enrollment website, there, were still, there was still some confusion. Um, so good to be able to understand what that is and um, and and clarify that it, it's you know we often think about reimbursement rates as the barrier to provider participation. Um, but we really found that breaking down barriers as well. Um, we noted we are starting with a small group before scaling up, and that's just been really great to have a team rethink through what the steps are and um, anticipate what the barriers might be and have a plan for overcoming those ahead of time. There were factors facilitating the partnership. Um, the first is the population overlap. Virtually all kids in Head Start are eligible for Medicaid. Um, and there's significant alignment between Head Start and Medicaid in terms of goals and requirements. Um, our federal Head Head Start program performance standards. Healthcare is a core component of Head Start, um, and Head Start already plays an important role in promoting healthy childhood nutrition. Our technical assistance was searching federal Head Start requirements, and we summarized those in one of our issue briefs. Um, coming from a Medicaid perspective, it was really quite a revelation how much Head Start is doing to ensure kids are getting their EPSDT visits and their needed health services. Um, there's overlap uh, with regard to the well child nutritional assessments kids get through Medicaid and the nutritional assessments performed in Head Start setting by Head Start staff. Um, Mary had looked at the potential for the Head Start assessments to fulfill part of the EPSDT well visit, but there were a couple barriers to that. Um, one is that the Head Start staff aren't licensed healthcare providers as required by Medicaid. And the second was that the coding of well child visits just doesn't separate out the individual elements for reimbursement. I'll mention that from the perspective of financing upstream prevention, we started relatively simply in that the nutritional counseling service sits squarely in the realm of Medicaid coverage. Uh, and that was helpful to get the work off the ground. And this is hopefully the beginning of additional partnerships between Medicaid and the early care and education sector. Um, I want some ideas for making the case for partnership and getting uh, MCOs Head Start programs to come to the table. Um, Head Start and Medicaid MCOs bring uh, different kinds of expertise towards improving child well-being. We've mentioned, as was shown in the, the example that Coco gave, 
Head Start has a strong tradition of parent engagement and family partnership. Um, and while pediatricians are trusted advisors to parents, um, they see their pediatrician only intermittently, whereas kids are at their uh, child care setting on a daily basis. And that frequency of contact leads to strong relationships and rich understanding, rich understanding of the social determinants of health. Um, so while MCOs provide care coordination for all their enrollees, not every enrollee is assigned a case manager. So leveraging Head Start case management um, can be able to help ensure families are accessing the full range of healthcare services. Um, likewise, MCOs can be great resources for Head Start health coordinators as working to ensure kids are getting access to the specialists and the treatment that they need. Um, I close by showing um, a photo of my own preschooler who looks very cute eating her mango here. Um, it's a tough customer at mealtime. So on a personal level, as a parent, I can relate to the value of having the Brewer Village with child care providers and health care providers all working in alignment to support kids and families. Um, and we'll stop there and turn it back over to Janet and Debbie. Great. Thanks so much, Alicia. That was great work. And so now we're open for questions. There's a couple of questions. I'll, I have some of my own, but there are um, some that have come through. So again, I want to encourage people, thank you, Janet, for showing that to really submit your questions. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Let me get to the first question. This is a, a question for all three panelists. What strategies do you recommend for engaging the insurers to come to participate at the table. Uh, you hear me? Thanks, Marianne. Did you, but now, oh, here we go. Oh. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Yep. When I think about you know, the work that we've done with our five MCOs, you know, so much of it has been about, you know, engaging them early and often and having them be part of the um, decision-making processes and being engaged <clears throat> the agency on how we move forward and, and having enough time to really um, examine the impact and what it means for them. Um, I just think that you know, from our five MCOs, what they really appreciate is that we don't come to them with decisions that are already made, but they're part of the of identifying solutions to particular issues. So I think it's been very helpful with them is um, just that frequent um, sort of uh, sort of a high touch approach with them. It was appropriate. And Mary and Coco, I would add on to that because clearly working with Pacific Source, we're super close, um, but we keep in touch. You know, we could even bring in others closer. I'd also add in there a lot of times the health plans have needs that a community can meet maybe easier than the health plan can. And so recognizing they need something too and in maybe in a better position as a community partner to fulfill a need that they might have and just being open to it isn't just so it's a dialogue and it's bi-directional in need and want um, and in exchange. And the more of those things that you can find where there's that cooperative and collaborative and those will help will help immensely. And I would again from Washington with our with our ACHs that that relationship between the MCOs and the ACHs has been really critical. Um, and you're right, it's both both can augment the work that each other does and those partnerships. Um, have really made a difference at the community level in terms of getting certain uh, kinds of projects off the ground. I would be helpful to um, get a good sense of what MCA are already doing. So they have a lot of different um, community-based interventions. For example, the MCA that's participating in Maryland's pilot had already um, outstationed community health advocates at Head Start settings. So they have, uh, you know, rapport relationships with Head Start. And so getting a sense of what might already be in place at the individual MCO level and then building on that can be a good way um, to get some momentum. 
adds that it's helpful because the kiddos have to meet certain um, goals as well. And so if you can learn what the goals are that they have to, what are the targets they have to meet in their state in terms of increased, you know, well child visits or increased, you know, rate traditional counseling, whatever they might be, you know, if you know what those are, then you can, um, as was said earlier, you can really match what you're trying to do with what they already have to do. The question. Another question, um, is actually for Coco. So it said, I've heard the Oregon Pathways Hub described as swimming inside your lane and effective at addressing the whole family. What recommendations do you have for other states and areas who would develop such an approach? Thank you. Uh, interesting. Outside your lane. Um, I would say it's swimming outside your lane. That's an interesting analogy, but not so far as that you get into too deep of the pool, to the end of the pool. Um, <laughs> the pathways pro well, the Pathways Program is about a set of, I think, a set of recipes. Um, or protocols that you're going to follow when you encounter somebody who has a particular need. The set of protocols, though, does not mean you are to go to the particular your person gets to the resource that works. So a good example is uh, housing, right? We have people who in our program who are not on the housing voucher program yet they they and there's obviously a their as care coordinators is get them to the housing authority to make sure that they have whatever paperwork they need to be successful with that first visit um, and and to set them up for success but they don't try to help the person fill out the housing voucher application that's what the housing authority does so really it's 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 making sure you stay na it's on navigation and the place where you, were, you will spend a considerable amount of time, or depends on your area, is understanding the resources that are available in your region. It is quite stunning when you start saying, hey, I need these resources, and how many organizations will start to raise their hands. And um, whether that's 2 on one and or 2 on one augmented or any other kind of resource directory, that will be a key tool for resource coordinators. Great, thanks. Um, the follow-up question, Coco, is how did you convince Medicaid to pay for the medical services and actually include it in the capitation rate? Well, part of it is the regulation allows for it. Uh, but right. I know, Coco, you have a deeper answer. Well, in, it, we've had many multiple examples of individuals who, um, yeah, they may have gotten their medical care, but because of what was happening outside of the clinic setting was impeding their ability to heal. And we had multiple cases of, uh, now the, probably the best one I have is um, uh, when had surgery, you know, had, you know, so they were, they, they were, they had uh, stitches on their leg and it kept not healing well and it kept getting infected. And so this meant, you know, repeated visits back and, and about, you know, and the whole slew of things associated with um, uh, a cut that just won't heal. And that couldn't, you know, so care coordinator went out to the hospital, came back and asked the doctor what the client should do about the goats in the house. So that's a rural community. Um, the doctor had no idea that um, what the dynamics were in the household that may have led to an inability for a wound to heal successfully. Oh, we have a protocol we need to talk about. There's no way somebody sitting in a clinic setting is going to have that insight about what is happening in the home environment. And then examples of that starts to really sort of show and highlight we can do better, and we can do better for our clients on a repeated basis. Let's figure this out. And um, we look at the two needs. When we, when we look at all the social service needs that people have around housing, and we have the chance to look at what they need for medical care, what we're finding is a high degree of overlap, an equal amount of medical care needs for people who are housing challenged, whether they be homeless, or about to be evicted, or whatever. 
issues that they face has to do with just accessing health care. That is in our wheelhouse. And you can't just do half and be um, dismiss the other half. You really need to put the two together. And we just happen to be working with Pacific Source in particular, whose mission statement as um, health plan is around, you know, care of the people that are in their that are in their health plan. So I think the combination of those two things has been absolutely fabulous. And one of them just popped up from my dear friend Amy Fine for Coco. The org has data on on successful completion of housing applications and percent resolved housing issues. I actually know the answer is yes. You do have that kind of information. Yes, and then the other question there was another question previously, Coco, about whether it was housing referral or actual housing. I think it's housing referral, but I'm gonna let you answer both of the questions. Yeah, so here's here's the population we chose to start with in our Pathways program for just the, the context is uh, individuals that we define as housing. Housing could be that they have utilities. Hello? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, for people that are housing challenged, it could be that they're homeless, but it could also be 50% or more of their income on um, housing, uh, utility issues. We also include any of the kids taken to the DHS custody as housing challenge because their housing situation just changed up pretty big. Um, so we have a very broad definition of what meets housing challenged. And in there, with every pathway that we have for housing, we track, was it closed successfully, closed unsuccessful? If it was unsuccessful, why? What was the main reason? Not all of those lead clients as to, you know, what data behind them there. Okay. Yeah, I think so. And here's a more general question. I mean, financing is always a challenge. Um, what would you say to those who want to do this? What advice do you have about how to get started? That's a question for all of you. And then there's a more specific question I saw that just went away, but it was about has anyone tried social impact investing? I'm going to let Marianne talk about that one. But why don't you all answer the, the, the bigger, broader question about um, what advice do you have for folks on the phone who want to get started in this and are looking to help um, um, with the Alicia, I'll go ahead and start. I would say that um, to get off the ground, I think one of the things that helped in Mary was um, was starting small. That was starting with a service that was you know clearly a Medicaid service, a um, state plan um, provided by you know a licensed healthcare provider. So kind of a degree of comfort for the medical, um, but delivering it in a non-traditional way, so delivering it in the Head Start setting. Um, so I think starting with kind of small scale and then branching out from there is one strategy for um, getting work off of the ground. Marianne, you and then answering the social impact investing question. From Coco on the financing question. Okay, and um, but, uh, um, another, a couple of other questions came in. One is, have you used data to increase multi-sector collaboration? If so, how? I'll say one of the things that was really interesting in the Head Start work was finding the resources through the Federal Office of Head Start. So there are uh, green, Head Start Center, you know, green Head Start program level reports uh, with a whole array of information um, that was really interesting to look at. So, for example, it has um, families who are different, getting different kinds of services, um, and it helps to kind of 
project out what sort of um, engage we could expect from um, from the Head Start parents. So I would say the um, those federal Office of Head Start program information reports are really a great, great source of information for looking at the, the individual Head Start program um, population. Any of that? What are the qualities of a good translator when establishing new collaborations? We spoke first of a translator. I think it might have been you, Alicia. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think somebody who has um, really lived in the in in those programs and um, you know has kind of experience in both sectors. So. Um, we work in other states where there are staff who are from agency outstationed to another, so they really have that um, experience of being, you know, sort of day-to-day -day immersion in, um, in the world, so they can really translate, well, you might be using these terms, but it might be the same across sectors, but the terminology is so what you're describing is case management is, you know, you use different efforts to describe what that is, and then folks will understand, like, oh, yeah, we do have that. Thank you. Sorry, I can hear you oh, again. I, I was for whatever, muted out for a while. Yeah, there was one about um, social impact investing and what states are, any of the three states are exploring. So I thought you might want to... Uh, touch on that one, and then a more general question about where do you even start when you want to think about financing? I, I thought you might be helpful on the, both of those, Mary Well, a couple things. On the social <clears throat> financing, again, we have been very fortunate because we've been working with Nemours um, <clears throat> in helping to identify an approach, and they have a gentleman that they've been contracting with that um, works a link. I guess the best way I would describe it is is to help link um, government entities, whether they're state or local, with the op opportunities to find different organizations that may want to partner with them on social financing <clears throat> or, or identify opportunities with social impact bonds. So we are very close to moving ahead with that. I have to say that it is not easy. Um, it's been you know quite a haul to kind of make that match between Organizations that would like to partner with with these, um, and um, I'm hoping um, a year from now we'll be able to share um, <clears throat> that we actually have a project in play and are moving ahead. We are um, intending to do a project on um, <clears throat> looking at uh, excuse me <clears throat> group visits um, for um, for pregnant, and we have had some work that we've done on that in the organization and so but one way was to figure out how to finance it so this is an opportunity to do that so um, we have because uh, we've done a fair amount of work in this area we even before we partnered with Nemours we brought in an intern into our agency to help look at opportunities uh, they are out there um, I think it's just hard to find that right match sometimes yeah just on that note, we are, um, Morris is continuing to work with, with Marianne on this in the sense that we're going to lift up the lessons learned by working closely or, um, and learning about um, this process with Marianne and her team so that we can write about it in a way that can help other state Medicaid program agencies who are interested in exploring this. So more to come on this, but probably not until sometime late next year to be, because we're just getting the project going. Another question, Marianne, that I think it might be helpful for you that came was, how do you engage Medicaid directors who may not be as open to this broad view of Medicaid's role as those on this call? Oh, wow, else? that's a great question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, of course, every state is different. You know, it's that old thing about you've seen one, Medi you know, you've seen one Medicaid program, you've seen one Medicaid program. They're also different. They operate differently. They cover different sets of services under um, or whatever is within their agency. So, 
but I, I do think that um, get, developing a relationship with um, the Medicaid director or their deputy or um, whoever is the program person related to the area of interest and, and be able to, you know, that what you're trying to do and what the kind of outcomes that you might achieve. I think the papers that um, that Nemours has developed really do help make that case. And if you can find evidence where that is working, um, it perhaps get them help get them linked with other successful Medicaid programs across the state. Or we know that X state is doing this. Um, maybe we could set up a meeting with them to talk about what they did and how they did it. I think most Medicaid directors, at least that I've worked with, um, you know, really interested in how to streamline and improve the program. Um, you know, they're all working with tight financing, so things that help um, finance things differently, um, looking at different ideas around value-based purchasing. Um, I think that when you come to the table well prepared and have ideas, and ideas particularly that you've seen work or heard have worked in other places can be very helpful. Um, but at least my experience is most Medicaid directors that I work with, and I'm on their board, so I, I meet with many of them, um, are quite open to different ways of doing business. Every state also has, you know, a legislature, a legislature that you have to work with, and so there may be even limits that are more legislatively directed as opposed to specifically on the Medicaid program. So spending time with and um, getting um, you know, some key legislators um, interested and engaged can also be quite helpful. And as a former Medicaid director and one that still you know, loves the program and works on the program of that Medicaid program, what do they care about? And to think about what you're trying to do within that, you know, within that framework, because as Marianne says, every Medicaid director I've met does want to improve their program. And um, said on tight budgets and trying to find other means of funding things. Yeah, right. So uh, the uh, other, uh, another, oh, go, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Coco. Yeah, the thing, I guess the thing that I would also is where can, you know, there's a, there's our opportunities where efficiencies can be gained, right? And really, um, you know, we were just talking about this a week or two ago in terms of Head Start does a fabulous job with uh, developmental screening that is a core instrument that primary care needs to see. Um, how do you take the results of those developmental screenings and get them into the hands of a, of a physician? It means putting people on a shared, you know, a, a, a way to be able to actually move that data from one Head Start setting to a clinical primary care setting. And when you can talk about those kinds of efficiencies, I do believe Medicaid directors are very interested in understanding what those opportunities might be. Great. One more step, three, three. I guess there's one more question I want to squeeze in there. Some of these projects may have short-term impact and some long-term impact. How are you monitoring the processes and or impact on a, a per capita cost or total cost of care and, and are you doing that? For the Maryland pilot, we're really we're really kind of focused on the feasibility piece before um, before to the, the evaluation of effectiveness and long term impact long term impact. But um, so it's basically seeing we can and get the the, the pilot running and scaled up, and then it'll be looking you know first at process measures of um, service utilization to start. You know, say in Washington, because um, the bulk of our work right now is sitting under 1115 waiver, we have to be able to demonstrate budget reality so that it doesn't, isn't costing the Medicaid to do these programs, it isn't costing the Medicaid program any more than it would have otherwise. So we have a whole mechanism that has to be approved by CMS in terms of how those budget neutrality calculations happen. So we've had to baseline um, you know, what, what we've spent, and um, we have performance measures that we fall back on. Um, so ours is really built in as part of our waiver. But I think setting up whatever an ROI-type 
infrastructure, we also have um, uh, access to some researchers that can help us. I think somehow if you can bring in independent evaluators that can help you look at that can be very helpful. Yeah, great question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, in, our, in, in Oregon, while you know, we're constrained, we're, you know, we have to continue to operate within our budget, and so that ends up being a constraint. I think the thing we're trying to figure out since we're working with clients, you know, housing and food and transportation are issues. How do you do, what is the scope of an ROI or val, what's the value brought to the community um, outside of healthcare? And um, that's, a, that's something we're trying to wrestle with because it might be fewer people in the jail. It might be some other value that the community highly values, not just the healthcare piece, but we don't, we're still working through what all that scope might include. Great. Well, we are um, uh, just past 3.30, and I really want to thank the wonderful panel for just so many insights and all the wonderful work you do and really being leaders across the country in this area. And we have a lot of great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get at all the questions. Uh, I, will, I did want to say that we have all of these materials and briefs on, um, as you see, the web, web page there. Uh, it's in Nemours' website, uh, Moving Healthcare. Uh, stream.org uh, for more of this information. It's also on the Academy Health website. And again, I want to thank Enrique and his team as well as the Robert Johnson Foundation for the work on this with, with all of you. And with that, I think we're going to close this. As I said earlier, we're going to send the recording and the slides to one who registered so that you'll have that. And um, Look forward to future uh, work with everyone on the phone. Thank you so much, everyone. Everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.